Hamilton's printed views. In keeping with Vazi's sensitivity to context, we'll begin our discussion of each site with details taken from Noli's 1748 plan of Rome and Vazi's 1765 panorama. The first and earliest of these is the Porto di Ripetta, the city's upper river port near the mausoleum of Augustus. Designed in 1703 by Alessandro Specchi, the Porto di Ripetta was part of an ambitious program of public works undertaken by Pope Clement XI Albani to stimulate the economy of the Papal States. Specchi's design included not only the system of sinuous steps and curving ramps that affected the transition from water level to the streets of the Campo Marzio, but a custom house and a chapel as well. Specchi's print representing his own design captures the bustling activity <coughs> focused on the re-entrant curves of the steps ascending to the pre-existing church of San Girolamo de Schiavoni. A superb impression of this print from the collection of Vincent J. Bonanno is one of the high points of the exhibition upstairs. A photograph taken around 1870 from downstream shows how the Porto di Ripetta offered vistas out over the water to the pastoral amenities of the Prati di Castelli. Uh, there you can just see in the distance the port and here the Prati. A second photograph offers a stevedore's view of the river port. The convex exedra that forms the centerpiece of Specchi's design projects at the left, while the ramp that follows its curve, together with the diagonal formed by the cascading steps on the right, draw the eye in the river, to the river loggia of the Borghese Palace. Specchi's scenographic composition, displaced by the Tiber embankments in 1889-90, counts among the most serious losses to the city's inventory of 18th century buildings. The most significant example, perhaps, of 18th century Roman urbanism is the Spanish Steps, constructed between 1723 and 1728. This staircase affects a crucial link between the new quarters of the city developing on the hills and the older abitato in the floodplain of the Tiber. The stairs also provide a visual link between the 17th century Barcaccia fountain at the base of the Pension Hill and the 16th century church of the Trinità dei Monti above. Uh, so on an only map, uh, the uh, Barcaccia fountain below the church above. Since the 17th century, the embassy of the Spanish crown had fronted on the piazza at the bottom of the hill, giving it the name Piazza di Spagna. The church of the Trinità dei Monti at the top of the hill belonged the French religious order of the Minims, and had been associated with the French crown since the early 16th century. During the 17th and the 18th centuries, as these two Catholic powers vied with one another for the dominance of Europe, the hillside became a hotly contested space. The English name given to the staircase, Spanish Steps, is misleading, for in spite of its vicinity to the Piazza di Spagna and the Spanish Embassy, it was initially conceived as a monument to the glory of the French monarchy and was paid for out of the bequest of a French diplomat. Politically and visually, the steps relate to the French church of the Trinità dei Monti above rather than to the Spanish embassy below. Right. In the 1660s, the French went so far as to solicit a design from Bernini for a permanent staircase on the hillside, which would have had as its centerpiece an equestrian monument of Louis XIV. <laughs> the erection of such a monument in the heart of papal Rome would have constituted a visual affront to the Pope and a thumbing of the Gallic nose at the embassy of their arch rivals, the Spanish. As such, it was not sanctioned, and the steep hillside continued to have a rustic appearance, as can be seen in this early 18th century view showing laundry washed in the Barcaccia fountain hung out to dry. After a hiatus of several decades, Pope Clement XI revived the project, favoring a design by Alessandro Specchi, whose Porto di Ripetta we just considered. The French Minims, however, preferred to employ their own architect, Francesco de Santis, and since the French controlled the purse strings, they eventually prevailed. Significant 
De Santis's executed design betrays the clear influence of the proposals of Bernini and Speck. Through the sinuous play of reentrant curves, De Santis realized a fluid civic armature that facilitates movement, but also encourages passers-by to pause and admire the spectacle of the city or engage in conversation. In this respect, the Spanish steps are overtly scenographic in nature, providing a dignified urban stage on which the drama of daily life continues to be played out. As a postscript, we should note that half a century later, in 1789, De Santis' scheme, uh, the scenic composition, was further enriched by the placement of an Egyptian obelisk at the top of the stairs, one of the last instances of papal patronage. At the same time the Spanish steps were under construction, another site across town on the west bank of the Tiber was being laid out. This is the garden of the Arcadian Academy, nestled into the slopes of the Janiculum Hill, which has recently been the subject of a book by Susan Dixon. The site had a particular meaning for Vasi, who, along with many artists such as Piranesi, uh, was a member <coughs> of this literary society. Designed by Antonio Canavari and Nicola Salvi, both of whom also were Arcadians, the so-called Bosco Parazio resembles nothing so much as a rustic version of the Spanish steppes. In keeping with the pastoral themes favored by the Arcadians, the Bosco Parazio is a play on the ancient poet Marshall's trope of Rus in Urbe. It brings the countryside into the city, but does so by adapting the curves of De Santis's decidedly urban Spanish steps to the expression of organic, natural forms appropriate to a garden set. Canevari's perspective drawing shows how one terrace level flows into the next and also reveals a rich sculptural program that was never executed. The curving ramps leading up to the oval amphitheater where the academicians met to recite their poetry express the metrics and the imagery of the Arcadians admirably. Graceful, free from ponderous rhetoric and oppressive structure, and fully integrated with nature, the Arcadian garden remains an enchanting sight. Here, as Montaigne's remarked of Caprarola, architecture has married nature. Within its shaded confines, the spirit of Settecento Rome lives on. Until recently, the attention of historians of 18th century architecture in Rome has focused on major architects and on monumental buildings, most notably churches and princely palaces, the kinds of examples we've been looking at. This emphasis, driven in part by traditional art historical models based on hierarchical assumptions about quality and style and authorship, has yielded a distorted picture in which the city appears as a collection of monuments isolated from their urban context. A glance at Noli's plan or Vasi's panorama, however, is sufficient to confirm that the familiar set pieces of monumental architecture are embedded in the more modest yet vitally essential interstitial tissue of every living city, domestic architecture, providing for the needs of the vast majority of the population that did not enjoy the privilege of noble birth or high ecclesiastical office. Over the past two decades, serious scholarly attention has been directed towards the documentation and analysis of Rome's housing stock in the 18th century. The results, though still incomplete, <coughs> shed important light, not just on the history of an important building type and its role in the incremental shaping of the urban fabric, but also on the history of the architectural profession. In the absence of, of a firm documentary basis for attribution and dating, these buildings used to be considered to be the products of anonymous builders, and, to the extent they were studied at all, were often grouped together under the rubric of architettura minore. This term is doubly misleading. Associating such buildings with vernacular traditions and suggesting that they are qualitatively inferior to and derivative of a category of major monuments associated with known architects. At best, they were said to reflect the prevailing influence of one particular style or another representing a diffusion from the top down. A wealth of documentary evidence now paints a very different picture. 
confirming that much of the new housing built in Rome over the course of the 18th century was designed by professional architects. In many cases, these were the same men who also served aristocratic and institutional patrons in realizing large-scale, high-profile projects. To the extent that affinities of style may be perceived between apartment buildings and the facades of churches and palaces, in many cases, such similarities can now be attributed to the straightforward instance of two buildings sharing a common architect. <laughs> Moreover, in a number of documented cases, architects first developed their personal styles by working on relatively modest housing projects, and only subsequently realized the opportunity to design monumental structures, thus controlling the hierarchical model of diffusion, pardon me, contradicting that hierarchical model of diffusion from the top down. Thanks to the work of Mario Bevilacqua and others, not only have the designers been rescued from anonymity, but so too have the clients and the individuals who became their tenants. As a result, we can now appreciate the social and economic dimensions of these buildings in ways never before possible. In light of this new documentation, it also becomes possible to identify ways in which 18th century <coughs> Roman housing comes to depart from the conventions of previous centuries and offer new, more flexible models for, invest for investment and living that parallel contemporary economic and social developments. Building licenses issued by the Tribunale delle Strade document over 100 large, multi-story blocks of apartments, or casamenti, constructed in the course of the 18th century. Judging from these records, the most intensive building activity occurred in the four decades between 1725 and 1765. Casamenti were concentrated in the most densely built up areas of the city, in the bend of the Tiber, and between the streets radiating from the Piazza del Popolo, where the new apartment blocks often occupied the sites of several older houses. The owners appear to have been divided almost equally between private individuals and religious institutions. Related to the Casamenti are buildings dedicated to providing um, accommodations for the household staff of princely families, usually <coughs> built adjacent to the palace proper. A fine example is the Casa di Famiglia of the Lancelotti, constructed in 1751 following the designs of Egidio Marescotti. The ground floor provided space for the family's horses and carriages, uh, while the retainers lodged on the upper three floors. Filippo Raguzzini's Piazza Sant'Ignazio of 1727 to 35 offers a revealing example of how institutional patronage of housing was used to shape space and contextualize pre existing monuments. The property in front. Um, of Orazio Grassi's colossal facade was owned by the Jesuits, who desired to increase their revenue through the construction of rental properties. 